Well, in the last video, I gave you one analogy for the way the hypothalamus uh, and the anterior pituitary gland work together. But today, I'm going to use a different analogy. Um, we're going to imagine that there is some sort of a big corporate company. And with that corporate company, the corporate offices, they're going to be the hypothalamus. Corporate is in charge of figuring out all of the big stuff. What needs to be done? When is it time to start serving pumpkin latte? Okay, that'll be corporate's job. And then corporate will tell it to the store manager. Um, I don't know, when do they start serving pumpkin latte? But um, the store manager will get an email, an official email from corporate, start serving pumpkin latte. And then the store manager will tell the employee, now it's time to serve pumpkin lattes, all right? So keep in mind that the order is coming down from above and corporate is in charge because corporate knows what's going on with all the sales stuff. Um, corporate doesn't directly talk to every employee, just like the hypothalamus does not talk directly to the thyroid gland, directly to the adrenal cortex, directly to the ovaries or the testes. Um, the uh, corporate offices, when they make their decision, they talk to the store manager and the store manager is the anterior pituitary. And then the anterior pituitary is in charge of telling the employee what to do, right? Now, uh, I know that when I was learning this stuff, I was like, ah, oh, why does it have to be this complicated? And I'm sure you're feeling that too. Um, I, I wish I could convey uh, the um, revelation that I had when I was watching a biomathematics talk because yeah, I used to work at Caltech and that's what we do for fun. We went to a biomathematics talk and uh, he actually proved that this complicated system can more elegantly control the levels of thyroid hormone and cortisol in your bloodstream and can more quickly upregulate, mean increase the levels and decrease the levels. And keep in mind that this is an important way that whatever is going on in the world around you can influence your hormonal status, right? Um, we're going to talk about how when you're chronically stressed, like maybe taking a class online, um, that your levels of cortisol made by your adrenal cortex will go up. Well, how does this little gland sitting on top of your kidneys know that you are stressed because you've got exams coming up? How does it know? Well, it knows because the store manager told it, because corporate told it, all right? So let's go on with this concept. Um, here we go. We have got um, control by the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, for example, will decide that you're stressed. Remember that the hypothalamus is a part of your brain and it's busy listening in on what you're thinking about and how much your sleep you're getting and all of that kind of stuff. And when it decides that you're stressed, it will say, like corporate says, time for pumpkin lattes, it will say time for more cortisol to be released, okay? And when uh, they say time for pumpkin lattes, then it will be the manager's job to receive that message and the hypothalamus sends it in the form of a hormone tiny amounts of hormone for reasons it's probably better I don't go into, tiny amounts of hormone, very difficult to actually detect on a blood test. But the hypothalamus will send out a chemical signal, a hormone, and that will go here to the anterior pituitary, the manager of the store. And then the manager of the store will say, boss, I'll get right on it. We're going to start pumpkin lattes. Right? And then the, the signal that the anterior pituitary sends out is, is a hormone and its target cells will be in the adrenal cortex. Then the adrenal cortex will say, oh, time for pumpkin lattes. And then it will start making its hormone, in this case, cortisol and more pumpkin lattes, right? So a couple of things. One thing is the employee is not supposed to sell pumpkin lattes unless the manager tells it to. In other words, if the manager went silent and never said anything about pumpkin lattes to the employee, the employee should not make pumpkin lattes, 
right? Okay. And then the manager should not send out the signal to make pumpkin lattes unless it gets told to do so by corporate. Okay. Now, what are these signals of which I speak? The hypothalamus makes, in this situation, makes a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone or CRH. Now, I'm not gonna quiz you about what CRH stands for, so it might help you to remember a couple of things. One thing is, this is one of the sequences you need to know for your exam. One thing is, all of the hormones whose names end in the letters R and H, all of those hormones are made by the hypothalamus. Now, not all hypothalamic hormones end in RH, but if you've got the name or abbreviation of a hormone that ends in RH, it was made by the hypothalamus. I think that's useful to remember because there's just a lot of hormones out there, okay? And what does the C stand for in this case? It stands for, you can say it stands for cortisol. It doesn't, it's more complicated than that, but you can say it stands for cortisol. Ha, huh. now what would you imagine this hormone would be? First of all, where is it made? Hypothalamus, it's not even hard, right? And what would you imagine that that message made by the corporate office is designed to convey? It's designed to say, I would like the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. If you thought that, you would be right. Alrighty? So the hypothalamus is going to make corticotropin releasing hormone, sorry, CRH. And when it makes CRH, it is going to go in a tiny little uh, bloodstream that's called the hypothalamohypophyseal portal system. And that is because it is a portal system, which you should know from 150, is when two capillary beds are in sequence. You know, usually blood goes from the heart, arteries, capillary beds, veins, back to the heart. When it goes heart, arteries, capillaries, and then another blood vessel, and then capillaries before it goes back to the heart, that is known as a portal system, right? And this is a portal system that control, connects the hypothalamus to the hypophysis. And if I haven't told you yet, I'll tell you soon, the pituitary gland is known as the hypophysis, right? So make sure you know this slide, because I think this is a question on the exam. When you're stressed, the hypothalamus makes CRH. CRH goes to the anterior pituitary through this little tiny blood vessel, and that will cause the anterior pituitary to secrete ACTH. ACTH, its full name is adrenocorticotropic hormone. It'll release ACTH. And where are ACTH's target cells? Target cells are always the cells that are meant to get the message. And who is meant to get this message, make more cortisol? The adrenal cortex. And then the adrenal cortex will respond by sending out cortisol. And the human body has lots of target cells for the hormone cortisol. The target cells for CRH, actually the target cells for any, um, for any of the hypothalamic hormones are always in the anterior pituitary. Because, what did I say? The crazy rich guy will only talk to his right-hand man. Hypothalamus only speaks directly to the anterior pituitary by hormones. And so the target cells for CRH are in the anterior pituitary, and then the anterior pituitary releases ACTH. Its target cells are in the adrenal cortex and cause the adrenal cortex to release the cortisol that it made. And then you've got more cortisol in your bloodstream when you're stressed. Okay, ta-da. All right, so that's what we were just talking about. And by the way, we're not done with the concept. We will get back there, okay? But here's what I was going to tell you. The pituitary gland is known as the hypophysis and the anterior part, the front part, is called the adenohypophysis. Adeno is the scientific word for glandular. And remember the anterior pituitary is made out of glandular epithelium. The posterior pituitary 
is the neurohypothesis because the posterior pituitary is actually made out of nerve cells. Now, follow me on this. Wait, we are, yes, okay. Follow me on this. For me, it always feels a little bit like the posterior pituitary is just a part of the hypothalamus. Okay, it's not, anatomically it's not, and I'm sure there's a good reason why it's not. Here's why it feels that way to me. There are nerve cells, and you know the anatomy of nerve cells. The nerve cells have got their cell bodies up here in the hypothalamus, and they send their long axons down into the neurohypothesis, the posterior pituitary, and it's the uh, synaptic, it's the terminal parts of those nerve cells that make up the structure of the neural hypothesis, the posterior pituitary. Doesn't that kind of feel like, well, wait a minute, if the cells start here and end there, how can these be two entirely different organs? Well, they are, but now you know why I feel like it's kind of a cheat. However, that does give you a mental picture of how does the hypothalamus control the posterior pituitary. The hypothalamus holds the nerve cell, uh, the neuron cell bodies that are busy making a couple of hormones that we will talk about. And, oh, here they are, oxytocin and ADH. Um, the hypothalamus, those cells are making it. And well, one cell makes one and one cell makes the other. Anyway, and then when the hypothalamus says, hey, we want ADH to go out there, it just sells a sense an action potential, a nerve impulse down the length of the axon, and that causes the end, and the end of those cells is making up the structure of the neural hypothesis that causes them to release the, um, that hormone, and it goes into the bloodstream. So here it says hypothalamohypophyseal tract. Okay, fine, that is true, but I am crossing it out because I won't use that term on the exam, okay? I will use the term hypothalamohypophyseal portal system, but I will not use the term tract. However, you do need to know that the hypothalamus controls the anterior pituitary by re releasing a hormone that travels through this portal system to get to the anterior pituitary, whereas the hypothalamus controls the posterior pituitary by sending an action potential down the neuron to cause the release of hormones from the posterior pituitary. Also, someday, maybe when you're in your nursing program or your PA program, there, there could be, a, there, it won't be on my exam, but there could be a tricky question like, where is oxytocin made? And you're going to think, ooh, the oxytocin gets made in the posterior pituitary because you know that's where it gets released. But technically, it gets made up, up here in the hypothalamus. Won't be on my exam. Tricky question, but it does explain that tricky question. So keep it in mind, all right? Let's talk a little bit more about the posterior pituitary. <clears throat> Um, the host of hormones of the posterior pituitary get made in the hypothalamus and they get transported down the length of the nerve cell to the posterior pituitary itself. And then they get released from the posterior pituitary when the hypothalamus sends an action potential down that axon, right? And these are the two hormones. This is antidiuretic hormone and this is oxytocin. This is for the next exam, so put a note, change your pen color, highlight it, do something, okay? Look at how similar oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone look. Look at how similar they are. They are <clears throat> peptide hormones, which means they are short chains of amino acids. Antidiuretic hormone, it will target the kidney and it will um, this is not the right size. Uh, it'll target the kidney, and when it targets the kidney, it will cause the kidney <clears throat> to, um, sorry, you can't see my writing. It'll tell the kidney to make less urine. That's how it got its name. It got its name 
anti-diuretic hormone. Anti means, sorry, anti means you're against it. Diuretic means making a lot of urine. So when, when this particular hormone is around, then you will not make very much urine. So when would be a good time to not make very much urine? Well, when you're dehydrated, right? When you're dehydrated, you wanna keep all that water in your body. You don't wanna keep peeing it out. So when people have got low blood pressure, <clears throat> oops, that's not a pen. This is on the exam too. When people have got low blood pressure, sorry, or when people have got um, hypertonic plasma, which means their plasma is too, has got too much solute in it. Those are the two times that your hypothalamus will say, hey, we need antidiuretic hormone. We need to conserve water because water will dilute out all those solutes. And more water will mean there's more uh, blood pressure. We'll get to that in the next uh, module. Okay. But what does oxytocin do? Totally different, causes labor contractions. And in a woman who's nursing her child, it'll also cause the milk to come out of the mammary glands. And yet, look at how almost identical these are. So each one of these is an amino acid. There's glycine, arginine, proline, cysteine, cysteine, tyrosine, right? Almost identical. The only two that are different are these two. Those are the only two that are different. They're almost identical. And yet, oxytocin will not change what's going on in your kidney, and ADH will not make a woman go into labor. Even though they're almost identical, they do different things because the protein receptor is going to be kind of like, kind of like a lock. And two keys on my key ring, they might look almost identical, but they won't open every door in my house, right? They, just because the keys look a lot alike doesn't mean they, they are different enough that they won't be recognized by different locks. Same thing with molecules being recognized by receptor proteins on or in a cell. So remember, oxytocin and ADH look almost exactly alike, and they are the only two hormones that are released from the posterior pituitary, which is called the neurohypothesis. We're going to pick up there at our next video.